Okay, I think we can probably make a start. So um, thanks for, for joining us out there. Uh, my name is Julie Ryan and I'm the Managing Director of Custom D and I have with me today Matthew Rhodes who is uh, one of our co-founders. Uh, Custom D are the creators of custom web and mobile apps and that is exactly what we have built for one of our fabulous clients, Paul Becker, who is joining us today of Art Money. Um, this is our second webinar in our startup series. Um, we take a really good look at what and who make these businesses tick. Um, I don't actually know when the term startup became so prevalent and such a, you know, such a core part of our vernacular, um, but it is, um, and, and often it is associated in the tech sector, which of course is where we're at. Um, over the past few years, it has been our, our real privilege to get to know Paul um, and get a front seat experience of what it's like to get a high growth company like Art Money off the ground. Um, I'll let Paul explain a bit about what Art Money is, but um, I'd just like a couple of moments to have a wee gush um, and talk about just um, how much and how proud we are to be part of the team. Um, or part of your team, Paul. Um, Paul comes at everything with just so much passion and energy that um, I, I find it personally very inspiring. Um, I have watched Paul as he has navigated many difficult situations and made hard choices. Um, and he manages to have this relentless positivity that um, is quite infectious. Um, and um, he also has a very clear focus on where he's going, um, but he manages to balance that really nicely with keeping an open mind and um, looking at uh, problems with from different angles and alternate solutions to, to find answers to those problems. We've come to know Paul over the years, um, but much more than just as a client. Um, we have enjoyed dinners in New York, <laughs> comedy shows at the Apollo, um, but we have over the last six or so years lived and breathed art money with Paul and uh, I, I, I feel like we are almost emotionally invested ourselves in seeing it succeed. Um, so it is thrilling to see um, you enjoy so much success over the last couple of years, but over the last couple of months in particular with um, your successful capital raise. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, Paul, if you could tell us a little, about, a little bit about your background and um, maybe a bit about what Art Money is. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Well, that's the nicest wee gush I've ever heard, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, look, I've had a 25-year business and it feels all roads have led to this and about five years ago we launched art money and art money essentially helps people to buy art so we do that instead of paying up front people pay over time and uh, it's a win-win business model we pay galleries the sellers straight away 10 percent commission uh, allows us to make it interest free for buyers so a buyer instead of a ten thousand dollar work artwork paying up front they pay a thousand dollars a month over over 10 months get to take the work home on day one so it, it's kind of a win-win business model um, in Australia, uh, New Zealand. Some people call us the afterpay for art. Um, you know, product-wise, there's some similarities. Um, Profile-wise, there's a lot of differences. Um, but essentially, that's what we do. So we, we're the first and only ones doing this in the world, in the art sector. Um, we started in Australia five years ago, and it sort of quickly spread to be a, you know, we wondered if we could change the world. and decided to have a go and uh, yes yeah, so I've been living in New York for the last four years to um, build the US side of the business and um, all through that journey the um, you know the the team from Custom D has been behind us and and developing our product and our route to market and uh, implementing our algorithm and um, it's, it's funny because we're a, we're a fintech you know we're a fintech although our fintech is not our point of difference. You know, we're we're bringing this to to the art market, and we're the problem we're solving in the art market is why we exist and why we're growing and why the opportunity is there. 
the tool that we're using to do that is, is the FinTech tool. But to me, that's kind of like all behind the scenes. But, um, you know, what you guys have brought to the table is really kind of world-class tech that, you know, we're competing on a level with companies that have got billions of dollars behind them, literally billions. And we're this tiny little business with this fantastic partnership that has changed and stood the test of time and still growing. And um, yeah, so it's great to be working with you guys. So look, that's, that's about our- really, I think the thing that really um, endeared us to the idea right at the very beginning was the fact that, you know, it is difficult for artists to, to, you know, to sell on any meaningful scale unless you've got sort of, you know, high profile and, um, and whatever. And, and, you know, this is just some way that they have a better chance of kind of etching out a living for themselves and um, facilitating that those sales which is you know their lifeblood to kind of carrying on and doing what they do you know what is their passion absolutely i mean and, and you know artists have a right to be professional and and make a living out of their their work yeah. and their career and um you know artists need to sell work to put food on the table and essentially the problem we're solving is it's too hard to buy art and it's too hard to sell art and we're just making it easier for both sides um you know so we're helping artists sell work um and we're helping galleries sell work who you know both those parties sort of have both creative and commercial imperatives to sell buyers want to buy want to engage want to want to go in more deeply want to know where to start and we're just kind of really bringing the sides together and making that happen in a, in a much easier way. Um, and kind of in a way that has happened pretty much in every other industry, but has never come to the art world because the art world is kind of very conservative, old school industry, even though the, the values and the, the ideas around the art world are very contemporary. Um, so yeah. it's a strange mix, but um, It yeah. is a strange mix, isn't it? Because you've got something which, you know, to some it's perceived as, you know, maybe a wee bit elite, you know, there's a lot of money involved, but then if you talk perhaps to the artists, you know, or, you know, your average artists, you know, they probably don't see themselves as, you know, raking in big bucks. Yeah, this is, this is the thing. And, you know, something like, you know, something like 90% of all work sold by volume, 90% um, of all work sold is under a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. But all you read about is the $10 billion Picasso sales. That's mm -hmm. in terms of media, you only look at the 1%. And that's true in a number of industries, but you know, you only, so the perception of the art world is 1%. But if you actually meet artists, they're just really normal human people that are doing really interesting, creative things. And, you know, I kind of think that the more culture and creativity we have in our lives and our society, um, it's a better place to live. It's, you know, it's, it leads to more engaging with art, leads to more creative thinking, more problem solving skills, you know, and these are, these are things that our, our world needs today. So, um, but it's also a human to human connection, isn't it? You know, well, that's absolutely right. Because the thing with art that not everyone kind of gets, it seems obvious, but not everyone gets it is art. There's only one, one unique piece in the world. You know, there's a few things that have additions, but generally it's one unique piece in the world. And there's one maker that has created this thing. And, and if you buy that work or that becomes part of your life, you know, that's one unique object in the world. And it's got a story. The mm. whole thing with art, the secret to art, it's about the storytelling and mm. what that means and what it means to you and what it means to the person that made it and the connection between and a time and place in your life. Mm. It's a bit like when you listen to music, it has a time and a place and you, you know, you, you, you remember. Yeah, when do you listen to Ebba? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's the other side. So, um, yeah, so it is a very human connection and it is very, um, uh, you know, I don't need to go into that, but I kind of do think the world is a better place for, for more culture in it and more engagement with artists and, um, uh, and as well as just very practical things like bringing, you know, creative thinking and problem solving skills and, and seeing, you know, this is, this is skills that Apple and Google want in their employees, you know, so it's got as well as sort of being. The skills a, that we want in our employees, like, you know, you might, the average person may not um, fully appreciate the creativity that's needed to produce world-class pieces of software. You know, our guys have to be creative. They need to be able to think laterally. They need to be able to come up with solutions to problems that are not obvious. Absolutely. And and that's, I think that's a skill set absolutely in tech that, you know, in more and more workplaces, we're just realizing that that's, you know, you, mm. you can't change a person if a person doesn't innately kind of have those creative thinking skills. Um, then 
you know, you, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to progress. And then that's, as I say, just really kind of best practice in the workplace now. And, and I think that's a really practical outcome of just being exposed to, to differences in cultures and different ways of thinking. And mm. so, yeah, that's, that's sort of, you know, the nice play, pull it and fancy kind of <laughs> side of it. But um, yeah, so, we, and, and we're just basically in a marketplace sense, trying to encourage that on both sides that, you know, allow increased engagement, if you like. Mm. Okay. So before we get into some of the more meaty questions, let's do a little bit of positioning around, you know, how art money came about. I think Matthew's got a couple of questions. Do you want to mm. take away, Matthew? Yeah. So obviously, Paul, you came to us over five years ago with the idea, but was that idea, like, where did that come from? And was there a catalyst that actually led you to take the leap? Because I, f- I find that's quite interesting. Obviously, a lot of people have ideas, as you've said before, ideas are easy, but you know, going after them in execution and implementation is the hard bit. But, you know, what, what made you take that leap and where did that idea come from originally? Yeah, well, I suppose the idea that this problem existed, that it was just too hard to buy art and too hard to sell mm-hmm. art, I suppose that came about because of the things I was doing in my previous business, which were publishing and events and, uh, you know, ran Sydney's Contemporary Art Festival without engaging more people with art. So I came to understand the problem by being very close to the marketplace. Mm. And then it was like this thinking about, well, what can I do about that problem? Is there a way to solve this? Is there something I can do about that? And um, I suppose it was just a series of coincidences and events and timing and right place, right time. And I got to this point where it was like, you know, if, if not now, when, and kind of, if not me, who, and mm. you know, am I just going to think forever about this and <laughs> what am I going to do something about it? Um, and so I decided to just have a crack basically. And, and look, you know, maybe because as I said, it felt like everything had led to this, um, in my 25 year business, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, so it was just a combination of circumstances and the time and place felt right and I just decided to give it a crack. And then so we started off and we pretty quickly had success in Sydney and then the rest of Australia said, hey, can we be part of this? And we went, yeah, I was, sure, why not? And rolled it out to that. And then surprisingly quickly, actually, within a year, we were in the US looking at the market there because for context, Australia is 1% of the world market, the US mm. is 4%. So um, once we'd sort of decided, hey, is this a global problem we can solve, you know? Um, You know, so we did a scoping trip to the US and, you know, thought, yes, it is. We actually launched in New Zealand first ahead of that. New Zealand was really more a test market to sort of see what it was like launching a new country before we did it in the US. Um, But yeah, it it was the time and the place. And I suppose the idea that, hey, maybe I can have an impact on a in on this whole industry on a global scale and that kind of opportunity to make that kind of difference doesn't come across your desk very often mm. so, so it was like so you didn't think that at the beginning you didn't you know i mean they say oh you need to think global right from the start so you, at the start you you didn't think as broadly as that or was that kind of in the background somewhere <laughs> well i'd like to think it was all part of a master plan right <laughs> <laughs> um I probably wasn't thinking globally on day one, you know, I mean, or maybe just a little bit in the background, but really um, one of the things that happened was the city of Sydney was launching their first ever cultural policy and um, they wanted, they reported us as part of, as part of this, uh, their program. And um, so kind of for that reason, it was very Sydney centric. It was Sydney based. And then as I say, quickly, the rest of Australia said, why can't we do this? And as that started to happen, it was like, well, Sydney, Australia, you know, <laughs> this problem actually exists everywhere. So no, I can't, I can't, maybe it was just because of bandwidth and ability to focus, but it was, mm. it was, you know, I didn't really have the world in mind on day one, but, you know, when I look back now and go, shit, we made that decision one year in, that was incredibly early. And I did have VCs and stuff saying that's too early, just focus on, you know, prove it out here first and so on. And so, of course, I ignored that advice. <laughs> 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 there, of course, but, uh, yeah, so so it, it came fairly quickly, but not on day one, I have to admit. I remember you being, you know, confident though, right from the start when you brought <laughs> the idea to us. And like, did you do anything to validate the idea even before starting 
you know, wanting to start development? So did, were you talking to people about it or did, would you just... Well, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I suppose one of the things for us, and they do talk about, like one of the things I'm big on now is like, how are you going to get your first 10 clients? Like for me, yeah. everything now, every new idea, everything has to has a, have a business model around it. So ideas are not enough. What's the business model? How is it going to be sustainable and pay for itself? And then part of that is how do you know if you've got something? And for any startup, I think the most important thing is how do you get your first 10 clients? How do you get them to pay for it? How do you get your first 50? How do you get your first 100? And if you can get your first 10 clients and they're willing to pay for it, then kind of you've got something. You know, you may not know exactly how the form or where it's going to go, but you kind of got something. And yeah. so I'm very focused on that now. We were fortunate because of we were in the marketplace in various ways. You know, we're very close to our market. We're all art lovers, art buyers. Uh, the rest of the business was, you know, whether it's publishing or events or whatever, working with collectors, working with galleries. So we very much saw the problem firsthand and we were very easily able to test if we, if it was a problem we were solving um, very early on. So we were, and, and, you know, we had success on day one in the marketplace because we were, you know, pretty much knew what that problem was. So yeah, what problem are you solving is always the first thing. And then can you, is it a big enough problem for someone to actually want to pay for it? Mm. So and, and we were pretty lucky to get through that pretty early. Mm. So if you were to go back and start again, would you have approached the MVP phase differently? Do you think you could have got there faster? Um, the MV, uh, MVP, um, minimum viable product. Um, I don't know. The only thing we could have done, and this is this might sound bad for you guys, but if we, I think the only thing differently. I think we'll cut there, will we? <laughs> um, no, it's an interesting point. Well, I think with, this is a, really relevant to a lot of startups because that's that you know it's that crucial first phase. It's like, what can you do? What's the minimum you can do to test the idea and validate the idea? And oh, we, yeah, okay. So let's let's yeah. agree on that. That as soon as you you, you don't want to overproduce it, you don't want to because mm. whatever you do, you know it's not going to be perfect. It's going to change, right? So you really want to get as quickly as you can to minimum viable product, and and you guys helped us do that. Now sometimes I wonder. And investors wonder how that path might have been different if we'd had, if, for example, I'd had a co-founder who was a tech co-founder. So we would have had some tech in-house capabilities. Now, I've never regretted not having that because I think working with you guys has given us a lot more flexibility than I would have had with one technical co-founder, right? So, but it maybe would have been a different path. Maybe we would have had a different mm. version of the MVP or we might have been able to tweak things a bit faster or whatever. But um, so, so I don't regret that. But yeah, for some VCs, it's a real hang on, you're, you're a fintech, but you don't have a tech co-founder? Like, what's the story there? I go, well, I've got this great team in New Zealand and they're like, they're pretty much in-house, you know? We, we talk to each other 10 times a day on Slack and, you know, Saturday afternoon, <laughs> Robert <laughs> sends, sends some stuff or some new updates or whatever. It is. <laughs> like, they may as well be in-house. It's just the concept that you guys have got your head around. I don't, but like I so said, that's the only thing, Matthew, whether if I'd had an in-house as I say, technical co-founder, we, you know, that MVP might have looked a little bit different, you know, but no, in terms of getting to MVP, um, getting something in the marketplace, like when I look back on what our product was on day one, it's frankly embarrassing. And, 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 but it should be this. Should be, right? <laughs> so if, if it's not embarrassing, you're not moving fast enough. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure our product today, when we look back in two years, we'll be embarrassed by that. But but the thing is, that's not the point. It's not the point to get it perfect. The point to get mm. is how fast can you test it in the marketplace to see if you are really solving a problem or how you're solving that problem. Mm. And that changes over time. So just getting it in there and and then we go, well, God, we're solving such a problem here that people are happy to put up with all the clunkiness of that. And okay, we'll fix that. And that's all relative. But, you know, um, as I said, compared to the guys with apps that are backed by, you know, $100 billion companies and so on, you know, we're not that far off. It's, mm. it's pretty incredible because it's actually less about the product than you think and it's about solving the problem. Hmm. I think that's really important because, you know, a lot of people do get worried about first impressions and that, that idea that I need to have all these features. In yeah, and that, that they've only got one chance. You know, we've only got mm -hmm. one chance to get this in front of people and if we don't impress them right away, then, then that's it. Like we're, you know, we've gone burgers. I'd almost say it's the opposite. It's, it sounds counterintuitive, maybe, but actually you um, you think you have an idea about how to solve this problem, but 
until you test it, until someone's happy to pay for it, you don't actually really. Mm, mm. And that changes over time. And, and so, you know, and if you have a cohort of 10 or 50 or 100 and your market is 10,000, well, then it doesn't matter if you kind of don't get it quite right for those 100 because you're learning every time and, and you just keep iterating, fast iteration. So, yeah, get that minimum of what viable product out as fast as you can and, and keep iterating and keep testing and see what's happening in the marketplace because mm. that, that's certainly the key. Don't make it perfect from day one. You know, we have this thing, don't make it perfect. I mean, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, he's literally got that written into his decision-making rules. You know, we, we want to make decisions on 70% of the information. Like he's got a number, 70%. Once you're at 70% of the information, you make the decision. You know, right. disagree and commit. Doesn't matter if anyone don't, no one agrees, disagree and commit. 70%, he's got like a number for it. <laughs> yeah, he seems to be doing okay. <laughs> he's doing all right. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so on there, let's talk about product management, like how you manage the, the art money product. I think, Matthew, you've got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Mm, so, you know, every time we sit down, there's a lot of opportunities with art money. There seem to be new ideas every time we, we chat in terms of where it could go. Um, that can lead on to a lot of different features. Is there, you know, how do you manage that? How do you manage what to invest in, what features to build versus what to hold off on? Um, do you, you know, do you respond? Do you prioritize user feedback or are you, you know, working to a bigger picture plan? Yeah, well, I suppose it doesn't matter how much money or how many resources you have, you always want to do more than you can. And so, mm. you know, particularly for us as, you know, first in the world in this market doing it, um, there's too many opportunities. So our, our issue is really to focus on the core, you know, focus on what's going to be give us most bang for buck, focus on what's going to get us along the path to our ultimate destination and not get too distracted because we know we can get too distracted. Um, so to answer your question, Re, customer feedback, um, I suppose I've kind of put in two buckets. There's the big picture vision and where we want to go. And I think for that, I'm more in the kind of Henry Ford, Steve Jobs camp, like Henry Ford, if you ask people what they want, they'll say a faster horse. Uh, and Steve Jobs never was much for market research. He kind of had this vision and knew we wanted to get there. So I think at a big picture level, we're a bit like that because without sounding disrespectful, many of our clients don't kind of know what's possible or where they want to go. So, if so the meaningful kind of, feedback comes from clients more maybe around like usability and um, experience. Well, this is the other bucket. This is the other bucket. So that, you know, in a, in a very practical sense, in a, in a more detailed sense perhaps um that's very important you know and again because we're very close to the market we get a lot of that and we kind of understand why they're saying that and and so that does drive the sort of you know week to week month to month kind of product changes um to be fair one of the biggest changes in our product has come from clients saying oh look we're doing this i won't go into the detail of what it is but you know we're doing it like this but what if could you could I be able to do this as well? And that was actually, to be honest, clients that client feedback less about the product and more about, I suppose it is the product, but about how to use it. Mm. That was that was a fundamental part of our product market fit in the US. Like so, now we kind of, now we kind of have two ways to pay over time. We're about mm. to roll out the second way to pay over time. And that did come directly from clients. But again, that was about solving a problem in the marketplace. It wasn't necessarily a feature set. It was about a problem that we were only solving half the problem and now we can solve the rest of the problem in the marketplace so that definitely came from clients um so yeah it's i, I think you need a combination is the answer mm. and i guess similar to that what what is the strategy around technology because there you know it does play such a key role in art money you're taking something that is you know would traditionally i guess be done offline and, and, and bringing all of these different tools together online you're integrating with different systems like what is the uh, what's from your end what's the strategy around that like it's obviously something that we're pretty familiar with but um yeah do you find that do you find it overwhelming or do you how do you sort of approach that uh, strategy around technology is almost to make the technology disappear that mm. you know this is this is a marketplace that wants to transact buy and sell and we're very much using technology as a tool to aid that, but that's really got to be in the background. You know, we, mm. we, I prefer to think of ourselves as an art business rather than a finance business, you know, mm. 
Um, so the the fintech has just got to be almost behind the scenes, so people don't realise it's sort of like a like a referee in a football game or an umpire. You know, you don't want to see the umpire, you don't want to see the referee. Mm. You just focus on the game around it. So the yep. best referees are not noticed. So the best fintech, the best technology is just not noticed because it just all works and it's seamless and it's enabling people to do what they want to do. So um, that that's kind of our goal with any of our tech is that it just enhances the experience without being the centerpiece or without getting in the way it's yeah. and and you know what we're doing is is pretty sophisticated like we're pulling people's you know we we through i mean i love apis apis let us talk to anyone now um but you know we're pulling people's uh private and confidential information we're pulling their credit score we're making decisions around uh underwriting criteria and how how much how much we'll finance for them um we're doing photo identification stuff um, to match a passport photo or a driver's license to a face. You know, these are all pretty high tech, sophisticated pieces of technology that we're using and it's changing every day, particularly in the photo ID um, things as everyone's sort of more conscious of anti-money laundering laws and know your customer and so on. So, you know, that, that's all kind of cutting edge technology, but it's just all about how that can just support the experience and just be, mm pretty seamless you know so that's that's low friction low yeah carry, yeah 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 um but we're also using you know what they call reg tech you know legal and regulatory sort of side of tech um particularly around know your customer um and anti-money laundering laws in, in in the art market uh, we're also using that to our commercial advantage so for example in the uk there's uh you know there's legislation in place today that if you're selling more than 10,000 euros to, to anyone uh, of art, then you need to do due diligence on, is this really, you know, KYC due diligence? Is this a real person who I'm dealing with? Um, you know, is, is that the, you know, the whole photo ID thing? And um, that's going to become more and more a standard part of all our lives. Um, so we're kind of using innovations in regulatory, innovations in tech, innovate, you know, all of those things just to enhance our product experience, enhance our kind of marketplace experience as well. So it's a means for an As a non-tech yeah. non yeah. founder, do you, have you found that, like, can you talk about how you found that as a non-tech founder of you know, a business where technology plays a really significant part? <laughs> well, well, maybe some... Some people might say it's blissful ignorance because um, <laughs> my, my approach to all this is like I can, technology should be able to solve that problem. Like I, I know that can be solved and I kind of go, oh, well, that's that's the easy stuff. You guys work that out. <laughs> so, so maybe it's just actually not getting too bogged down in that. It, it enables me to see the bigger picture of how it can be used. And I just assume you guys and whoever we work with can um, can solve the, the problem, you know? So we look at best press best practice tech around the world and hey apple's done it so why can't we do it <laughs> google's done it why can't we do it you know <laughs> um so yeah it, it's i think it's actually probably helped me um not get too bogged down mm. Mm. yeah i was just i was interested but when you were talking about um you know that that you some of your early investors were talking about you know would it have been different if you had a another tech founder partner with you um, and, and undoubtedly, it would have been a different um, a different path you went down. And I wonder whether, because you are non-tech, you are looking at it purely from that, you know, from a much more pure, what is my business, not getting too wound up in the technology. You know, I think you're able to kind of stay away from that um, much, much more easily than if you had someone that was very technically driven. Um, That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's right, Julie. And, and you know, I, I think it's it's easy to get bogged down and stuff otherwise. And, um, yeah, again, with the tech being the tool, you know, the idea is the problem solving. How are we going to solve this problem? And how are we going to, what's our business model around that? I mean, that's essentially the, the yeah. question. Yeah. And then the tech is a means of solving that. Whereas if you just too focus on the tech, and that's, again, why I like, using external providers like you guys because it's it's not just one voice or one set of coding or one thing it's it's a multitude of skills and you know you yourselves have a different you know view of of looking at things and so rigorous debates go on in here around how to solve some of your problems or how to kind of address some of the features that you're after <laughs> well, well that's great i mean that's great that's exactly what should happen and and 
You know, I think if I had one person trying to do everything that your whole team is doing, that just wouldn't be enough. That wouldn't work. Um, mm. And again, I'll get frustrated with VCs for a number of reasons, but, you know, one reason is this sort of narrow-minded thing about like, or is there a tech founder, you know, tick box, you know, I'll go, well, you know, I've got this amazing team that is like doing all of that and more. Why would I, you know, just because that's the way you approach it doesn't mean that's the only mm. one. So, uh, but it's an interesting, interesting point of view. So, um, but yeah, I definitely think not being bogged down in the detail has, has maybe helped the, you know, the, the bigger picture means to an end thing. So, so you're no longer, you know, what might be considered a, a startup, you're now an early stage growth company. What, can you tell me a bit about uh, what you think are critical elements of success for, for getting a startup up and running? Um, to be honest, I think resilience is the biggest thing. It, it's like um, one of the best quotes I've heard about this is, is you need, is to have unreasonable belief. And it kind of feels like you do need that unreasonable belief because everyone else sees problems or questions or issues and you see opportunities and, you know, particularly when things aren't going well or whether it's in the market or with investors or with people or whatever, you just need this unreasonable belief that, you know, you can do it and that there is this problem to be solved and that you have a way of solving it. Or if you don't have a way of solving it, you'll work it out, you know, next week or next month or next year kind of thing. So I think there's that unreasonable belief. It's that resilience is, is the biggest thing. I mean, they say, you know, Founders really have three jobs. Um, <clears throat> the three jobs are communicate the vision, build a team, and don't run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of, you know, if you look at it like that, it's pretty simple. So you know, I've never had a problem with the vision or communicating the vision. Um, I'd like to think I'm reasonably good at building a team. The running out of money has been the issue. <laughs> you know? um, as you said, we've we've just done our our Series A capital raise, so that's you know that's um, that's a big milestone for us. And yeah, to me that kind of converts us from the startup thing, which kind of has the implications that you, know, you might fall over tomorrow. So mm. now we've got a bit more runway, and um, uh, but you know that's been a huge part of my my life for the last couple of years, just just the the funding side and. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Like, um, like this was, it was we had a bit of a false start on the on the capital raise. You know, how can you t talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we've done it twice actually because so our first investor we signed um, signed a contract. It wasn't the term sheet; it was the final contract um, earlier this year, and um, basically just never came through with the money. Um, so that's all in legals. That was like multiple millions of dollars US and. Um, we just sort of eventually had to go, well, it's not going to come. <laughs> got, to, got to draw the line and do it all again. So we had to do all that again. You know, by that time, it was all through COVID. And so everything had changed. And uh, I was back in Australia, head in New York. And yeah, so we've actually done it twice. Do you feel overwhelmed by that? Like, I mean, we, we you know, we had regular catch-ups through that, that phase. And, um, you know, Matthew and I were both so impressed by... by <laughs> holding up under just such enormous pressure i think it's that unwavering belief is that's where we really saw that come through yeah. with you paul like just well I mean, it's, yeah and, and and it was we've got this far we've done this and we know we are solving this massive market problem so we know we have something and i i think if we didn't know that if i was still thinking oh is this the right thing do people really want this do people want to pay mm. for it you know, I think if I was questioning that, maybe I wouldn't have had the resilience to, to get through it. But yeah, because we knew we had something and we're seeing that every day in the market, we're seeing feedback from both sides of the marketplace, the sellers and the buyers, you know, it was that knowledge, not, not thinking, but actually knowledge that, you know, hey, we have something and we've come too far to let this fall over. So... That's, the belief, that's, a, that's kind of like the, 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 the thing that, that holds well, it together. That, well, then it's just my job. I've got to find a way. And that's what founders do. Founders find a way. Like good founders find a way. Whatever happens, you know, whenever you have a problem, whether it's with people or product or tech or whatever, you find a way. So you just have to find a way. And so with the where I was, you know, those three things that a founder has to do. Third one, don't run out of money. Well, okay, fuck, this is my job as a founder. I need to just find the money. I need to do what I can, however I do it. That's my job now. 
find the money and get it done. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, that that's. So do you have any on that? I mean, that is a really big deal for most startups, obviously. Um, do you have any thoughts on the best kind of progression around that, you know, um, bootstrapping versus seed capital versus VCs versus blah, blah, you know? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you capsulate them into a you know succinct, succinct sentence? <laughs> well, look, it seems like we've been bootstrapped the whole way, um, done it really tough. Um, but I think conventional wisdom says that when you do it that way, you're forced to make hard decisions and you you you're forced to know what's important and what's not important. And um, so I think even though it's been really hard and you know, we kind of see opportunities that we haven't been able to take because we haven't had the funding to do it, et cetera. I think in the long term, it's probably helped us. It's helped us focus on what's important and what we need to do to get the job done. And now we've got a little bit more money, then we can, you know, we're not dying wondering. We're not going, oh, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do this. Maybe, you know, we really know what we mm. want and where we're going. So that that hard work has sort of now, I think, set us up for our next phase. Yeah. Where I think on the other hand, you see businesses that, um, get thrown so much money at them, mostly in the VC environment because the VC environment is fast growth. They want to see ridiculous growth, care less about profit, want to see super fast growth. Often it's not sustainable. Often it's fast growth because you've had money thrown at it rather than you're solving the problem. So you're actually not really even finding out if you're solving the problem. If you've got product market fit, you're just growing because you've got a lot of money thrown at you. And uh, not many of those businesses succeed. I mean, it's human nature. You get have the money, you'll spend it. Now, um, so I, I think I'm definitely a believer in in the do it tougher <laughs> is better in the long term. Um, you know, it probably also helps you value the money when it does arrive. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, it's just everything is you know like in our business plan. I put stay lean and hungry. You know, um, mm -hmm. even Jeff Bezos says you know every year in his in his um, in his uh, investor report, he, he kind of says, we want to be a day one company, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how Amazon can be a day one company, but that's, you know, he's very focused on, we want to have the same spirit and ethos and, you know, values that we did on day one. And that's, you know, we, I think we have that a bit more organically, but so look, it, it's, I mean, I look at similar businesses that have had tens of millions of dollars, if not more thrown at them and they've got a hundred people and, it's a completely different pathway. Um, maybe it's right for some people. It's possibly more right if you're a SaaS company, you know, that's an option, you know. Mm. Um, but, you know, maybe some fintechs. But look, I, I don't regret it. I mean, look, of course, there's, you know, that also brings pressure, like the same pressure you have of running out of money, the pressure of, oh, my God, we've got all this money. If we don't grow and meet the expectations, that can be just as crippling, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah. So... Yeah, there's no right path for any any one business. I think it's just mm. different. And um, I, but I've certainly found that having angel investors at our early stage, you know, some of those angel investors have just incredibly added value to our business in terms of what they've brought, uh, their expertise, their their wisdom, you know, whether it's on the board or not on the board. Um, you know, so having the right people, you know, whether investors or or, or team, um, is, is critical. You know, that, that's maybe mm -hmm. that's more important than the money having the right people. Yeah. Well, yeah, also, when you, when, you, when you think about startups, um, you also think about or, or some sort of stereotype around some, you know, your, your Mark Zuckerberg, some 20-something-year-old, you know, hot chop tech guy. Um, but, of course, you, you come to the startup with the added value of all of that business experience that you bring over the 25 years. Um, so that, nice and <laughs> 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 yes, I have lots of business experience too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that that must make you have a you know much wiser head on your shoulders when it comes to kind of working out how to use that money or even how to run your business without much money yeah definitely uh, well, i think so um and i'm also a subscriber to the, the you know the the published data around older founders are more successful mm. uh, and maybe that's selective perception but <laughs> i think that's that's seems to be the case and um, well, i think the average age of um like unicorn companies of founders of unicorn companies is, is quite old like it's maybe yeah I think yeah, so. yeah. Mm. yeah much older than you'd think yeah um so you know zuckerberg's an outlier <laughs> in that sense you know? um so 
Look, I, I think that's true. And and like, if you think about those three things, communicating the vision, building a team, not running out of money, well, the more experience you have, the better you're going to do those things. Um, and the more resilience you have, you know, finding a way, the self-belief. Um, so mm, you know, yeah. it's not about, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, 5% the idea and 95% the execution, you know, building a business is all about execution. And so, you know, I think that stereotype of the young tech founder is, is more about you know, the idea, but I mean, you know, it's a journey, it's a journey and there's product market fit. Like Facebook started as a, you know, hot or not rating site, you know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. every, every business has every business, you know, develops and changes. And, and I think this is why the smart in investors back the founder as much as the business model, because they know, well, that idea may or may not work out, but I'm backing the founder because they'll find a way or they'll find the right product or the product market fit. You know, um, because what you see on day one is almost never mm. up. Mm. I think even with all that business experience that you bring, Paul, like at startup land is still quite an intimidating place. And yeah, you know, pitching to investors, networking, just yeah, you know, it's a different world. And and like, do you suffer or have you suffered from that imposter syndrome, or have you gotten to a point where you felt like, okay, now I'm, you know, now I'm a startup founder? Like, did, was there a point that you you get to, or do you still feel that way when you pitch sometimes? Or? Oh, of course, imposter syndromes are just a very real thing. I think in in many more walks of life than people admit. But uh, I think certainly, you know, I don't know if I'll ever outgrow that, frankly. Um, so you know, obviously, I've got a degree of confidence and a degree of belief, but. You know, so the imposter syndrome thing is, um, okay, we're a startup and we've done this, but we've got to our Series A. But, hey, plenty of people have done a Series A and much bigger levels of where. What about mm. B, D, E? Now, I'm very much not a believer in, but I'm actually a believer in being profitable. And so we don't have to do Series B, C, D. But, like, at every stage, there's so much more to achieve, you know? So it's when, when do you actually feel that you've, you know, there's no reason... I think the nature of a founder is always wanted to want to do more and better and grow and explore and, and, you know, achieve what you know you can achieve. And so that's, you know, for us now, we've, we're just barely scratching the surface, you know, there's so much more ahead to do. And so, no, I, I think definitely for me, it's, it's, um, you know, okay, I've done a deal or I can do this or I can do this at this level, but now I need to do it at this level. And the next year it'll be at this level. And then when mm -hmm. it's, you know, what about, mm -hmm. you know? So no, it's <laughs> um, maybe Jeff Bezos thinks he's <laughs> all that, but <laughs> no, I'm a long way off that with you. Um, also, just quickly, there is there is a little comment from someone. I'm probably going to pronounce the name wrong. Do, do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Um, hey, do you know? Guys, Thanks for joining. When, when are you guys coming to Canada? We need art money in Canada badly. Um, yeah, well, not, um, not badly. Bad. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, you know. Um, yeah, so Yoon Gallery has been a supporter of ours and made sales into the US. Um, yeah, the answer is as soon as we can. Uh, maybe next year, I'm not sure. It's partly, partly you know, funding dependent, but um, yeah, as soon as we can. I'd love to be in Canada as soon as possible, but yeah, a bit of a soft answer there. But, you know, this, this is the thing about making choices. Well, you know, we, we do want to launch in the UK next year and no disrespect to Canada, but UK is 20% of the global market. Canada is probably like Australia, 1%. And so it probably costs us the same to get to the UK as to Canada. And so we have to make a hard choice, like, which, you know, and again, cause we don't have money thrown at us and we're not, you know, we just have to go, which is the most important thing to mm. the next step. Um, so, you know, we've got countries around the world wanting to come to us and when can we launch? And that's a fantastic mm. thing, you know, that's what we want. Yeah. And I'd love to do it tomorrow, but we just have to go one step at a time and one, prove it out, prove it out to the next stage. You know, so prove it out to the next stage, maybe get some more funding or maybe we're self-sufficient by then. Maybe there's an IPO, you know, that, that might enable us to go, you know, we want to be a global business. We want to be in a hundred countries around the world. Mm. Canada will definitely be in the next three or four, you know? So, but again, being forced to make hard decisions about what's best for the long-term interests of the business rather than, oh, we got money, let's do that. Let's do that. Mm. See if that works, you know? Um, so, you know, we have a very, you know, the the, being forced to be careful with money and uh, has just forced us to make, you know, be a bit brutal about some of these decisions, mm. you know, but yeah, you know, as soon as we can is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the <support. laughs> so can we talk a little bit about, um, about sacrifice? Um, 
starting a business um, like you have requires, you know, absolute dedication. And part of that for you was up sticks and taking yourself off on your own to New York and, and kind of living your best life over there as best you can. Can you tell me a bit about, you know, how you found that, maybe the impact on, you know, your, your mental health, um, you know, being away from your family, that side of things? Yeah, well, I think it's um, about the focus. Like, you know, being a founder just needs that relentless focus. And um, part of that is just doing whatever it takes to get something done. Now, I was fortunate in my personal life that my kids were all older now. So, you know, I couldn't have done this 10 years ago. You know, there is a time and a place thing around these things. Like, I couldn't have done it family-wise 10 years ago when my kids were younger, but now they're, you know, my youngest is 18. And so, you know, we're good there. Um, fintech wise i couldn't have done it 10 years ago because the technology wasn't there and the um you know the apis and the mobile phone usage and so on so you know the problem the personal situation the fintech you know um yeah these are just combinations of, of things you know malcolm gladwell wrote a book about that um and which is really interesting about just people being a product of time and place um and I forget which book it is. <laughs> but yeah, so sacrifice, I think it's kind of, you make that decision really early on and, you know, if you're going to go for it or not. And then, you know, like in the US, a lot of people, when I'm trying to raise money, a lot of people go, oh, is this a lifestyle business? You know, because I'm not, <laughs> it's, you know, $100 million, you know, oh, it's a lifestyle business. Well, you know, I could have had a nice lifestyle business just staying in Australia and, and that would have been great. So I think if you do this at all, you kind of, you just can't half commit. You pretty much get found out in the first probably year, I'd say, if you half commit. So, you know, and being a founder is not for everyone because not everyone is able to have that commitment or mentally willing to have that commitment or, frankly, in a position of privilege to be able to do that. You know, like I put my money into this business and I've not earned salary for three years and stuff and not everyone can do that. So it is an element of privilege there. But so there's a combination of circumstances that... Um, it's, to me, it's pretty black and white. You're either, you have that unreasonable belief, that relentless focus and nothing else matters. And that's the sign of a founder and then things don't work out. So you have to find a way. So, and if you don't have that relentless focus, it's, you know, it's not for you. Mm. you know? Yeah. Because there's been a hundred times I could have given up and maybe that was the easy path, but you know, mm. I'm also a believer in sort of telling everyone that we're going to do this because then it makes you, <laughs> you can't go back because you'd be too embarrassed. You know, this. <laughs> Feels like that, but but it's it's very it's very much a mental journey. Absolutely, it's a mental journey. You've got to really be mentally tough, and I think mental health is a big issue in founder mm. world. It is in many worlds, but um, yeah, you need a real mental resilience and, and toughness, and mm. you know whether that's through a support group or your own thing or whatever. There's different ways to cope with that, but that's that's a huge issue for sure. Yeah, I cannot believe how quickly the time has gone. Ah. We must be having much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've just got a couple of couple of final questions. So um, the first one is, does working on art market money make you happy? <laughs> That's a good question. I think it does. I think it does because otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. I mean, otherwise the mental aspect of this would be crippling. It'd be that thing where you've told people you're going to do something, so now you have to do it so you don't be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is that fun? Probably not. But um, <laughs> I mean, it's satisfying. I mean, it's satisfying. I mean, it's not always a barrel of laughs, but, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm not driven by being a barrel of laughs. I'm driven by achieving things and the potential to change an industry, a whole industry on a global scale is just an enormous challenge and an enormous opportunity. So I think it's fun if you feel like you're achieving something. Um, and so, you know, I still kind of go to work every day thinking, wow, well, how am I going to change the world today? What can I do? There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of, you know, things, there's a lot of stuff happening, but um, it's not fun is the right word, but it's, it's you know, it's got to be enjoyable as a challenge. Enjoy, you know, look, hey, it allowed me to go to New York. Hopefully it'll allow me to go to London. It allow me to do things, you know, a lot of things that I would never have been able to do. So it, it's, it's a balance and um, yeah, so. When will uh, you know you've made it? Like what's the, what's the pinnacle of success? When you go, this is it, I'm here, I've arrived. That's such a hard question. Um, I don't know if you ever know that you've made it. I don't think there's ever one moment. Um, I don't think there's ever 
You know, if you have that founder mentality, you always want to do more and grow and be faster and better and impact more people and change the world, then it's never done. You know, I don't think it's ever done. Now, having said that, um, I suppose it's when I do myself out of a job, when we get to a stage where the business is big enough and organized enough and sustainable enough that maybe I'm not the best person to run it anymore. You know, when maybe it's less about ideas and growth and more about, or well, more about growth and more of what we have rather than new things. Now, mm-hmm. again, there's probably no limit to that, but you know, so that that's, that's, I mean, look, if you ask the investors that question, it might be, you know, uh, an IPO or a this or a that, but uh, mm. to me, they're all only means to an end. And, um, you know, I think it's immeasurable and it's never done. Um, but I suppose in a practical sense, you know, when, when the business has got to a point where someone else can run it, um, yeah. that's, that's yeah. probably, <laughs> probably my objective. <laughs> Okay, so we've got um, a question here from Morgan. Um, being a fintech, how does moving into new regulatory environments impact on your technology choices? Do you have to reinvent the wheel in each market? Um, yeah, good question. In a tech sense, not so much. In a tech sense, we like to think we're a global business and the tech that we have is applicable globally. And so that's one of the big advantages that we don't actually have to reinvent our tech in each market. Um, it is a high regulatory environment, um, and I used to hate that, but I've actually now come to embrace it as a barrier to entry. Um, mm. And so it's really more about adapting the tech to the, to, to the financial side, the financial reg tech, if you like, um, that, that is the challenge. So it's not the technology itself. The technology, I mean, I think what we want to have is, because we have a global focus, we want to have world's best practice tech Right. So, for example, um, uh, you know, if you look at the EU kind of market, then the EU is probably way ahead in, in GDPR in terms of this anti-money laundering legislation. You know, so we basically look at world's best practice, the toughest standard, and get our tech in a place to cope with that. And then, okay, even if the US is three years off that, let's go. Well, let's have world's best practice in the US. You know, so we're ahead of the game there. So, right. you know, it's if we if we look at best practice globally. And try and hit that mark with our tech, then that that's kind of our benchmark. So um, yeah, so it's different flavors of the tech really, um, rather than build each time, and uh, that's important to us. So um, yeah, so definitely we don't want to reinvent the wheel in each market. That's kind of yeah, we want to do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, well, um, as I say, I, just, I honestly, I can't believe how quickly that, that uh, we're nearly an hour has gone by for our 40-minute chat. Um, <laughs> but it's been really enjoyable. Um, and thank you for, for taking the time. I know how busy you are um, for, for stopping by and talking with us. Um, Pleasure, Julie. Pleasure, yeah. Matt. Thanks, Paul. It's been good. And all the all the best. I say that all the best. I mean, we'll probably be talking to you next week, you know. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you for, for allowing us to be part of uh, part of the Art Money team. We uh, our whole whole crew really enjoy um, being part of it. Well, thank you, and look, you're a crucial part of our success too. It, it's like really important to have good people and good partners, and and you know you can't do everything yourself. So it's um, you know the tougher things are, the more you realise how important good partners are, and yeah. so. You- you guys have stuck with us in tough times as well as good times. And so it, it's a really important partnership that I'm sure will last for a long time. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, have a nice afternoon and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.